Hello everybody. Welcome, welcome. Where's my speech at? Welcome. Dan, where are you? Let's see. Hello everybody, good evening. Can you hear us at the back? Yes. Yay! Welcome! For Ying, for Ying, for Ying here. So, who is here for the first time? Lindsay, I don't spit, you know that. <laughs> you can come closer if you want to. It's quite nice at the front, nice and warm. So, who, so I didn't see that. Who's here for the first time? This, Light's really bright. Ah, very nice. <laughs> Who's here because they're looking for a job? Hands up. Who's looking to hire people? There you go. Keep it up. Keep it up. So there was about four hands that went up hiring and about six went up looking, uh, looking for a job. Hands up if you're looking to hire. Nice. By the way, who, knows, who uses Groupon? They're hiring a digital marketing director. So if you want to know more about it, come and talk to me later. I think they might give you some shares. They're worth a few bob, right? They're not paying salary. So, paper. So I want to thank some sponsors. We have a sponsor that sponsored us for a long time, but he's been so damn busy growing his business. There we are. Good timing. Rackspace. So Jim, Jim Fagan from Rackspace is a sponsor. He's going to say a few words about Rackspace, saying, so Go on, say a few words. Thanks, Pauline. Um, just wanted to say, uh, you know, we're kind of happy to finally be officially sponsoring now that some of us can actually make uh, Web Wednesday. So, uh, if you're not familiar with Rackspace, um, we're a hosting company. We run uh, dedicated clouds and private cl uh, public clouds, um, U.S. company. We have a Hong Kong presence uh, data center here, as well as data centers in the U.S. and U.K. I think I actually talked to some of our customers are here tonight. So if you're looking to do anything kind of on the, on the, uh, on the web, on storage with servers, um, give us a call. So we'd love to uh, see if we can help you out. And then also look in the future on the uh, next couple of weeks on uh, some of the Web Wednesday forums. We're going to offer some specials and some different discounts and uh, offers for people in the Web Wednesday group uh, you know, to try out our services and uh, you know, see if there's anything we can do for you. And then finally on the hiring, we are looking to hiring. Uh, to hire right now, so if you're interested in sales, let me know and I will uh, be glad to talk to you about it. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. There you go, six of you, talk to him now. <laughs> He's going to go hang out in the back, in the toilet. <laughs> so, uh, we also, Dom, are you here, Epsilon? Epsilon? Did any of you get an email from me? A nice HTML email? Any of you? What, two? Oh, email still works, good to hear that. And also we have uh, David, David Ketchum, who's set up ADMA, the Asia Digital Marketing Association. If you're not a member of the Asia Digital Marketing Association, put your hand up now. There you go. David, we'll talk to you later. ADMA, good timing. Come in. Okay. And we do have Beansbox. Is Belle here? Belle? No, she, she designs websites. So this topic tonight is quite cool. And we also have something very unusual. Who ate far too much food over Christmas? Who feels fat? <laughs> Who's proud of feeling fat? There's two gentlemen at the back. Ashley, Alex, can you stand up, please? Where are you? These very fit young men run a, a gym, a CrossFit training gym, and they're sponsoring tonight's uh, prizes for the lucky draw. The first prize is worth 3,200 Hong Kong dollars, and it makes you strong. Personal training, it makes you strong. CrossFit Asphodel. Huh? Cannabis. Cannabis? Do <laughs> you want to say a few words? Come and say a few words if you want to talk about cannabis. <laughs> Whilst you think that, their second prize is one month unlimited group class attendance at CrossFit Asphodel Strength and Conditioning Lab, worth 2400 
And the third prize is full attendance on CrossFit Asphodel on-ramp strength. So before he says view ads, I was going to do that, but I did my knee in, so I, I'm not strong anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell us a bit about CrossFit. Let me say a few words. What is cross Cannabis. Cannabis. Okay, so we're a um, strength and conditioning centre that's just opened um, in Quarry Bay, um, accessible by the MTR at Taiku Station. Um, we combine Olympic lifting, Olympic weightlifting, gymnastics, um, body weight exercises. Um, we've got some really early morning sessions, 5 o'clock in the morning, if anyone's up that early. Um, that's a quiet one at the minute, that class. 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, every day of the week. Um, weekend classes, we do personal training, um, nutritional advice, turning people's lives around hopefully. New Year, good time to start. Um, and this is like a, it's a worldwide movement. We've got, there's, gy there's 1,800 gyms worldwide I think. Uh, it's a really popular way of training, fast growing, so if anyone's interested, follow up with the prizes and come down. And I've been to the gym, it's over in uh, Taikushin, Quarry Bay, so not far, good place, thanks man, thanks for sponsoring the prizes. So, let's see, I just want to tell you about an event, who has heard of the Social Media Week? Alright, so there's, um, there's a company called Impact Asia, are you here? Jocelyn, come over here, come here, Hong Kong is full of events, but I think this is quite a good one. We've had Tweet Festival, we've had all kinds of stuff. Here's Social Media Week, started in New York. I'm uh, helping organise it on the board. We're going to do a Web Wednesday uh, on Wednesday the 9th of February, which is not the first Wednesday, I'm sorry, because the first Wednesday is the day before Chinese New Year. And I'm going to interview Facebook, or a representative of Facebook. <laughs> I can just talk to Facebook. Yeah. So Jocelyn's going to tell you a few words about Social Media Week. So we've got Social Media Week coming up the 8th to 12th of February, and we're going to be hosting 30, out, up to 30 events across Hong Kong over the space of those five days, across a number of different industries. Um, our five days break down into five different topic areas. The first day is kind of our opening day with an opening press gathering and um, cocktail party, which will be hosted by Facebook. Our second day is dedicated to the social media landscape in China. The third day is decorated dedicated to Social Media 101, and then we have an Experts Day and a Community Day. Um, we're sponsored by the Wall Street Journal Asia, which is very exciting, and you can check out our website to register online next week when that goes live. So, um, yeah, we hope you can all join. What's Thank your you. Twitter account? There's a Twitter account, isn't there? Yeah, the Twitter account is SMWHK. SMW. Very nice. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Napoleon. Excellent, guys. So, that's a good event, it will grow, so I, I recommend attending that, it's interesting. Alright, so we have a speaker today that I'm going to do a slightly different approach. I went to Web Wednesday in Singapore last year, and they just do a speaker, there's no interviews. So I, Daniel here came to me and he said, I'm doing an event called User Experience, and I bring it to Hong Kong. And I, I listened to Dan on the web, and Dan has this wonderful, you'll hear it in a moment, he has this wonderful smooth voice that just calms you. You should work with the gym, actually. Get wonderful, smooth voice. And he's going to give us a talk. So tonight, we're going to try something different. We're going to actually show some pictures up on there. Um, it's, a, it's a PowerPoint, but he's a very good speaker. So he's going to talk about the value of asking why. I work in a PR firm, and I tell you, people do not ask why enough. So, Dan's going to talk about this, and then at the end of it, we'll take some questions, and we'll talk a little bit about usability and maybe some websites here in Hong Kong. I warn you now, this presentation is not about websites. Okay? So, uh, go ahead, Dan. Give us your word. I'm getting off stage now. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, howdy. howdy. What I'm going to ask you to do, if you don't mind, is just come forward just a little bit. It's okay. <laughs> Did I tell you had a lovely voice? There you go. <laughs> and I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about uh, this topic of the value of asking 
why? I guess life, life's a journey and uh, there's lots of uncertainty ahead. Uh, I think we have to deal with a lot of change. Uh, change pretty much every day, every week, every month. And certainly in the field, I'm, I'm guessing a majority of you in the field that we work in, uh, we're dealing with a hell of a lot of technological change as well. Um, we're all faced with choices. We have, in the world that we live in today, we're, we're faced with more, more choices than, uh, you know, probably our, our parents had uh, when they were growing up. On a recent trip to Singapore, uh, I was running a workshop on the usability kit and I thought this would be a, a good opportunity to get an advertisement in for that. <laughs> Uh, this, is a, this is a kit that I, I co-wrote with uh, Jerry Gaffney, a colleague of mine. And I was eating uh, dim sum uh, with a friend in Singapore. Uh, and I'm pretty critical of dim sum because I've come from, you know, the great experience of eating dim sum in Hong Kong. And I had a moment where I thought, you know, given all the change, and given that we're on a journey, and given that there is more uncertainty in the world today, it's really important to take moments like this to actually just reflect and enjoy. So what I want everybody to do, just before I, I keep going, is I want you all just to take a moment, not necessarily to reflect, but you can do that if you wish. Uh, just take a moment to have a little bit of a stretch. I'll start. CrossFit. Where's the CrossFit this is, this is, Yeah, this is really good for the training guys. It's good to see the guys behind the bar helping the fans. Have you noticed that they're not stretching at all? They're just sitting no, still. No, some of them are stretching their, uh, their drinking glasses. Um, before I talk also, I want to take the opportunity to thank my wife. Um, I've, I've been living in Hong Kong for a little over, over 10 years. And... Uh, I actually, I probably wouldn't even be sitting here talking to you all tonight um, if it wasn't for my wife. And I really like this picture of her um, in front of Buzz Lightyear in Times Square. And jo, Josephine actually thinks of herself as a little bit of a Buzz Lightyear, so... Yeah. Is, is that right, Jo? No? No. Is it your favourite character? I think so, yes. Okay. I think sometimes we all feel this way. Um, we feel a little bit misunderstood uh, in sometimes the work that we do in the digital area. Not everyone understands terms like usability. Uh, people don't always understand terms like design, uh, digital marketing, social media. And I think we're all, we all, we're all working hard to be understood. But I made, I made a couple of assumptions before speaking uh, with you all tonight. And I believe you, I believe you all, uh, all to be smart people. Um, I think that you're here in part, I mean apart from networking, I think you're here in part to actually learn. If it happens to be a person speaking with Napoleon or perhaps a person like myself that's been lucky enough to present to you tonight, you're here to actually learn about a particular topic. I hope I hope that you think about the world that we live in, that beyond the job that you do, beyond, uh, beyond our everyday life, that you're actually starting to think about the bigger picture. And I'm hoping that at the end of the day that you care, because this is not a religious speech, <laughs> but I hope that you care enough to be able to think how we can make the world a better place. And I'm not, I'm not about to start singing to start singing a Michael Jackson song. But I hope, I hope these are fair assumptions for at least the first half of the room. I'm not sure about the back half of the room. Yeah. But I'll, I'll get them eventually. I'll get them eventually. In terms of value, I was very deliberate in picking this topic of value because this is a topic I've been thinking about deeply for the last, probably last two years. And I want to explain to you where this came from. In terms of my own background, I started as a technologist about 15 years ago. 
And then I moved into the field of usability. Now, for those of you that don't know that term, usability, it's effectively we help predominantly technology companies help make their products more user-friendly. And over the last 15 years that we have been involved in project work, I've noticed that we've been successful as a consulting company in terms of people buying our services. But if people ask me, how many successful products have you actually worked on? I can't even count them on one hand. And that's somewhat depressing, and it's somewhat frustrating, and I started to think a little bit more about that. And I thought, maybe one of the reasons why we haven't been as successful on products that we work on is because we haven't been invited up front enough to be able to talk to businesses about how to understand the value of what you make. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. So there's lots of ways to think about value. Cost. Ownership. Health. Respect. Family. Property. It's probably an important one for Hong Kong. Gain. Wealth. Happiness might be one attribute of value. Now, I'm not here to say that these attributes are your attributes, and I'm not here to force these attributes on you. But what I am here to say is, here is a starter list of attributes when you think about value, and for you to walk away from tonight hopefully thinking about not only your own value, but also the values that you bring into the work that you do. So let's keep going. If you want one simple way to understand value, clean out the childhood room that you grew up in, in the house that was owned by your parents for 40 years. 40, 40 years, four zero. So me and Joe went back to Australia this year and my dad picked me up from the airport, picked us up from the airport. And he says, he says, as you know, we're selling the family home. I said, yes. He says, well, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to clean your room. Because <laughs> what I did was I, I left Australia thinking that one day I would return to Australia and probably like a lot of Hong Kong, Hong Kong people, never ended up going back. So my room became this kind of museum. So Dad, rightly so, said, I think it's time that you cleaned your room. And that's exactly what I did. Got the vacuum cleaner, put on the tracksuit pants, started to clean, clean out cupboards. It's a little bit dark to, to see that. It's basically me cleaning out the top cupboard. And I use this as an example of a simple way to understand value because it's, ama it's an amazing thing what you actually discover. Old school assignments, magazines, publications from your parents and our grandparents from Poland, toys, old discs, Rubik's cubes, old cricket balls, stickers, <laughs> I can see I'm, in, I'm, I'm with a tech crowd. Um, old boxes of old technology. So I can already hear. Who remembers the Palm Pilot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still got one. Wow, that's a bit. It's amazing. Someone at the back actually put up their hand and was talking at the same time. <laughs> Multitasking. I, I love it. Yeah, the Palm Pilot. And, and what? What struck me when I saw this was, again, in terms of the notion of value, is that at one time, this had value. At one time, this not only had price value, this had a deeper sense of value for people in terms of 
its function, its form, its design, its integration with the desktop, desktop, and so on and so forth. And at one time, Palm was the leader in this space. And over time, they disappeared. And now they've been acquired by Hewlett Packard. Now, we could spend 30 minutes just talking about the Palm story, but I just wanted you to reflect a little bit on how Palm at one time was a leader in their space, and no longer are a leader in their space. You discover toys. And yes, you'll see that there's a Womble there. I, I was the very proud owner of a Womble growing up. Uncle Bulgaria. My brother wanted to buy the board game, I wanted a Womble. A 1950s radio, 1950s or 1960s Australian radio. Now. When we pulled this out of my top cupboard in my bedroom, and I showed this to Dad, and I said, Dad, what should we do with this? Because my dad, had, I'll show you in a minute, he'd hired a bin, a big mini skip on the front lawn. And when I showed this to Dad, what, what do you think Dad's first reaction was? Put it on. Put it on? No. Keep it? No. <laughs> Chuck it. <laughs> Throw it out. And Joe, being the more environmental one, said, said to my dad, well, hang on a minute, before we throw it out, let's see if it works. So we plugged it in, and we turned it on, and it works perfectly. And so we brought it back to Hong Kong. <laughs> but again, the point is, this at some stage had value to my parents. It now, it, it now no longer has value, and it has the reaction within my dad, understanding he was in I'm moving house mode. But now it's, he's in the mode of throw it out. And this was the result. The result was a mini skip full of stuff that uh, we threw out. And what was interesting in the neighbourhood is how people just came out of nowhere and started to take this stuff away. So what's interesting in coming back to the topic of value is that the things that are that are so are so called not valuable to us may have some value to someone else. So I I continue to give this thought and I found this article on this website called Putting People First. And I'm not going to read you this full paragraph, but I did want, I did want to read this bit to you, because it struck me in the article. And I think it talks to the topic of value. And what it's actually saying is, if we can link personal satisfaction and self-actualization with a lower rate of consumption, and a more sustainable lifestyle, then we can create a society in which wealth means not having more, but living better. Now, I'm not here to preach to you about sustainability, and this is not a talk about the environment. There's, there's plenty, of, plenty of people who can talk to that topic a lot better than me. But this particular quote struck me because I started to think, well, maybe people are starting to think around in improving the experiences in their life beyond just having more. Maybe there's something to be said about that. And maybe we're the first generation that's starting to think about that, but maybe our kids and their kids will have this, have this something that's closer to their heart. So I wanted to take a moment uh, amongst yourselves, and I hope I can bring you back into my presentation. I want you to take a minute amongst yourself and I want you to ask the person next to you, or you can reflect on your, on your own, and I want you to think about what do you value and why. So just a minute. Everybody understand the question? I hope so. Okay, one minute. Go.
Okay, 30 seconds. Ten seconds. Okay, can bring it back. And I'm, I, I'm guessing some of you were trying to answer the question, and some of you were probably continuing networking, which is fine. But don't worry, don't worry. They, they talk like this the whole time, don't you, Jay? Okay, no problem. So what I'd like you to do now is just shout out words. I'm just interested in, in words to, to try and create a bit of a pattern. So what do you, don't have to put, even put up your hand, just what do you value and why? Just shout it out nice and loud. Family. My wife. Family. Family, my wife. Time. Time. Comfort. Comfort. Life. Life. Sleep. Innovation. Sleep. Innovation. <laughs> Space. Space is an important one for Hong Kong. Silence. Silence. Guys at the back, silence. Anything else? Hell. Alcohol. Energy. Okay. The, I guess the, there's, there's no right or wrong answers to this. Like, I guess there could be. But I guess it's to say that we, we, all, we all have different values around different things. And I started to think about this and, and, and get frustra somewhat frustrated by the topic. And when I got, get frustrated, I tend to write articles. <laughs> so I wrote, I wrote this article. This is, a, this is actually a really cool website called Johnny Holland. Johnny Holland is a website that focuses on the topic of interaction design. And this topic talks to the idea of why, why haven't we worked on as many successful products as we would have liked? And so I started to ask deeper questions around the value of asking why. And I'm sharing these questions with you because I think these questions you could apply to the products and services that you work on. So let's look at a couple. Firstly, what does the product do? In other words, when someone, especially in the technology world, is trying to synthesize and describe what their product and services, what they actually do, it's actually, it's quite challenging for people to come up with that one thing that it does well. Google, we're organizing the world's information. That's probably not exactly their tag, tag line. And they've diversified, of course, but they have a pretty good idea about what their core business is, what their meaning in the world is, and what they do. Some people I've spoken to, I say, what, so what, do you, what does this product do? Well, it runs JavaScript, and it has a platform that connects to Oracle, and then Oracle actually serves up a presentation layer, and that presentation layer, but what does the product actually do? So what does it do? What do you love about the products that you're working on? I know we can't all work on products that we love, but what we found in the work that we do is that the teams that love the products that they work on usually create better product. They actually create more valuable product because they're really excited about the domain and the product that they're working on. What does the product team, apart from yourself, what does the product team love about the product? How does that play into the culture of the organizations that you work in? And if you had to, if you could get out of your cubicle and you were tasked with selling the product, it's no longer just the responsibility of sales and marketing, you had to sell the product, could you do that? And could you do that with confidence? So, when a product becomes indistinguishable from others like it, and consumers buy on price alone because price is, as I said, price is one attribute of value, what is this called? Anybody? Commodity. Thank you. Commoditization. 
Have you been looking at the slides? <laughs> Commoditization. So here's an exercise. Here we have two iPhones. Which one is the real iPhone? Okay, so putting up your hands, who thinks the real iPhone is the one on the right? Put up your hands. Okay, put up your hand if you think it's the one on the left. Okay, we'll do it one more time. For some people are mixed up between left and right sometimes. <laughs> especially as the drinks start to... Who thinks the real iPhone is on the right? Put up your hand. Okay, cool. Some people up the back raising their hand and still talking, which is fantastic. <laughs> Who thinks the one on the left? Okay, probably leaning a little bit more to the, towards the one on the left. The real iPhone is the one on the left. No. This is the real iPhone. Oh, that was the right. Yeah, this one. I was, I was going with left and right on that side. So this is the real iPhone. But what's interesting with this is that it's becoming easier to copy. And I'm not just talking about China copying. I'm talking about just copying full stop. It's becoming harder to differentiate between product. Mobile phones is a perfect example. If you go into one of the, any of the mobile phone uh, providers here, and you go into the store, and you run your eye across the shelves, what you see is predominantly the same pattern. And it's very, very difficult to differentiate the better product from the cheaper product. So the question is, and I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions for you tonight, but the question I'm asking you is, if it's becoming easier to create copies, if, it, if commoditization is becoming more prevalent, how do you differentiate? So I was on the bus last year, 2010, with Joe, and Joe was reading the local paper, I think it's called the Hong Kong Standard. Is that right, Joe? And there was an article in it that said, what women want? A guy with an iPhone. And I thought, that, this is interesting. And I want to read you this quote. Men with iPhones are more attractive to the fairer sex than those who do not use the device, according to a survey by a British mobile retailer. Well over half of the 1,500 women polled said they were likelier to date a man with an iPhone. I'm in big trouble. I used to own a Nokia. Now I own a Galaxy uh, uh, tablet. I don't have an iPhone. I'm clearly in trouble. Now, some of you are, some of you are probably thinking, come on, Dan. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how can we even believe this survey? Is 1,500 women even enough for the scientifically minded of you in the audience, for the, for the people that think about quant before qual? Um, but in the, independent of whether you believe this or not, what I found interesting with this article is this. There's a perception out there there is a perception out there that some women actually find men more attractive if they own an iPhone. And the question would be, and I'm not going to answer it for you, but the question would be, what is creating that perception? What is creating that value for Apple in order to create that perception? Now, maybe some members of the ADMA might say to me, well, it, well Dan, it's marketing. It's lots and lots of good marketing big budgets for marketing, and promoting and, and talking about Apple. And I would say, well, that's maybe marketing is part of it, but it's not the whole story. So can can think about that a little bit more. So it's all very well for Dan to be sitting up here and talking about commoditization and value and differentiation. And, but what about the question of how do you actually differentiate? So I've, I've taken a little bit of a stab at this. 
um, and I'm hoping that you can help mature my thinking or help expand on this topic. And I start to think about this in the terms of dimensions of value. So for the products and services that you work on, and I'm not sure of the roles in the room, but I'm sure that you, you're all responsible for some part of value on terms of, in terms of what you're working on. I started to break it into dimensions. And these are the ones I came up with. Price, features, how stuff is made, maybe that's going to become more important to people. People looking on the box and saying, well, you know, uh, they, 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 they use particular materials, they, they have particular standards and working conditions in the way the product is made, maybe that's going to be important. Lifetime, I mean, the notion of the, the radio that I found in Australia, to me, that's something that should have lifetime value, but clearly didn't for my dad. Relationship, beyond, beyond the interface, beyond the UI, does it actually talk to you? Is it something you connect with? And community and concern, does it actually, uh, uh, does it talk into something bigger? And I would say, I would venture to say, that in terms of those dimensions of value, and there's probably more, there's a lot more that I'm missing here, but in terms of these dimensions, I would say, the ones that move away from commoditization are these. Lifetime, relationship, community, and concern. So let's look, at, let's look quickly at Facebook as an example. You know, I look at Facebook and I look at Facebook's valuation and I look at the, the craze that has started with Facebook and I think, yes, it's got value for people as of 2010. Will it maintain that attention in the next five years, ten years? Will people still have the same relationship with Facebook in the next five or ten years? And, and will people still be connected in terms of community with Facebook in the next five, ten years? As I reflect back on companies like Yahoo. So it's not, a, you know, the topic of value is not an easy one. So getting to value and meaning. How do you actually get to it? Well, I was in, uh, I was in New Zealand in 2010, and I was at, in, me and Joe were in Wellington, and we were walking to the office in Wellington, and we found this barber, uh, barber shop. And there was a sign outside the barber shop, and it said this. So when, when you see this sign, and feel free to shout out, also the guys at the back, they can shout out as well. <laughs> When you see this sign, what does it say to you? Good haircut. Napoleon said good haircut, maybe. What else does it say to you? Old school. Old school? What does that mean? Traditional. Traditional? Shades. What's the classical barber joint? What is that? Just gents. Just gents. Thank you. This sign just says, this is a place we cut hair just for men. Just for men. Now, I'm not here to talk about whether that's right or wrong, but what I like about this business is the business has a clear focus. The business is saying, in terms of what do you do, I tell you what we do, we cut hair and we just cut hair for men. That's what we do. Patelli Bikes. Um, this is, I, I took this from an article from a blog by a company called 37 Signals. 37 Signals are the guys that make uh, web-based software, collaboration software called Basecamp. And they were writing about Patelli bikes. Napoleon's going down the back to, to shush them up. And I wanted to read you this quote. Patelli is a great example of a company that knows where it stands. The best way to know where you stand is to figure out what you won't do. I'll repeat that. What you won't do. What will you say no to? Francesco, in other words, Francesco Patelli, puts his nose right out in front. It makes the experience, it makes the experience better for everyone. More businesses could benefit from putting their nose right up front. So here's an example. We've got a barber in Wellington. We've got Patelli Bikes in, in New York. They know how to say no. And this talks to value as well. A lot of the products and services that we work on, when it comes to features, 
It's less about saying no, and it's actually more about saying yes. Yes, we'll do that. Yes, we'll implement that. Yes, we'll build that. Yes, we'll add that bell. Yes, we'll add that whistle. And I would, I would suggest to you tonight that there is something to be said about saying no. But not no for the sake of no, but no with a rationale. No, in, no by knowing what you do and what you do well. So how do you do that? And we're moving towards the end of the presentation now. I think there's lots of ways that you can find value. And there's lots of ways that you can implement that on the projects that you work on. But I'd say one way is small teams in rehearsal. So I liken this to, this is a, a lovely band, uh, a little orchestra, I guess, that we're, there's probably a formal name for it, for, for those of you in the, that know more about music than I do. But this was a local street band playing in Munich last year. And the thing that's very obvious about a band is that everybody knows their role. Everybody knows what they need to do to work in concert to deliver the product. And what's the product? The product is the music. The amount of times we've consulted into businesses and we've had 10 to 15 to 20 stakeholders sitting around a table talking about what they like and what they don't like is the wrong way to approach product strategy. It's the wrong way to design. I'm not suggesting that we move towards the, the, you know, the, the, the urban myth of the Steve Jobs approach, which is basically designed through, through being a dictator. But I, I would say there's something, there's something interesting about rehearsing and iterating with small teams. I think we should be faster to experiment, and I'm not talking about agile, because agile is still to me a very techo, technologically driven buzzword. But what I am saying is the notion of iterating design, the notion of not moving quickly to a finished product, the notion of uh, sketching with your teammates, the notion of walking through designs with your teammates, the notion of collaborating around design, and being able to do that faster and earlier towards trying to find value. So what does it mean to be valued as we, as we move towards the end? Well, I've thought about this not only on a product and service and a project level, I've thought about it on a personal level too. And I've broken it down into five things. To be valued around self, what we make, the places we work, the communities we live in, Hong Kong, and the leaders to get us there. And I'm only going to cover one, three, and five briefly. Firstly, self. In 2009, I wrote an article again, out of frustration, and I wrote an article because, um, well, this was February 2009, so almost two years ago, the shit was hitting the fan economically. And as a small business, we were starting to think, well, wow, uh, are we actually going to win any project work? Um, are we going to be alive in the next year? Um, we started to question our own value. So I started to think about this and think about, well, if we don't have project work, how does one self-improve? And I thought, well, one way is to improve your knowledge. So I would suggest to you that you should be constantly reading. You should be constantly uh, uh, going through your RSS feeds and improving what you know about your particular domain. And I guess in the digital crowd tonight, that might be a whole range of topics. But become really, really good at what you do. And the way to do that is to read. Share your knowledge like I'm doing tonight. Um, it, takes, it, takes some, uh, it takes some guts to be able to sit and share with the community. So be able to, to, to stand up front and contribute with your community. And don't be afraid to lead, to lead in your particular, in your particular domain. The places we work. I think if we look at the places that we work there, you know, we, we, we work within different cultures. And I'm not talking about Hong Kong as a culture. I'm talking about, um, you know, country, region, corporate, team, different cultures. And they're influenced by different things. But 
But the cultures in which we work, the, the one I want to focus on specifically, the workplaces that we work affect what we do. And I would say that if you're not, if you're not happy in the work that you're doing, if you're not feeling valued, I'm not here to say leave your job, but I'm here to say ask yourself what is it about the place that you work that you either like, love or don't like and how could you actually improve that? Now for me and Joe, as a small business, it's, it's a lot easier. We can, we can decide on the environment that we want to create in our business. But from what I've seen in our consulting, the teams that create the best product usually work in environments and cultures that they love. I went to visit, just quickly, I went to visit the Google campus in Mountain View in Silicon Valley. And it's like people are walking around like they've swallowed happy pills. <laughs> Everybody just loves working for Google. Now, you might say, well, hang on, Dan, Google is cash rich. Google has, Google has a crap load of money. Aren't they all leaving for Facebook? <laughs> and they're all leaving for Facebook. But, there's, but that, that's a culture story too. There's a culture, there's competing cultures. There's a culture that's, being try, that's trying to build up at Facebook that's trying to attract talent away from Google, which is a good thing. It's a good thing, healthy competition. So I found this quote uh, from Knowledge of Wharton. It's one of the publications I subscribe to. And uh, they interviewed Jack Welsh. I think Jack Welsh is the ex... GE, thank you, XGE uh, CEO, and I wanted to uh, focus on this uh, particular quote from the article, and this is what it says, and he's talking about finding results, which is a you know which is a classic uh, business term: results, quarterly results, results, delivering on results. Any fool, for those at the back, any fool can deliver in the short term. By squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. At the same time, just about anyone can lie back and dream, saying, come and see me in several years, I'm working on our long-term strategy. Neither one of these approaches will deliver sustained shareholder value. You have to do both. So what I like about this quote is it's saying, well, when you think about value from a, from a hard-nosed business perspective, Maybe businesses also need to look beyond shareholder value. Maybe businesses need to look beyond just quarterly results. Maybe businesses need to have other attributes that apply to value. And finally, the leaders to get us there. And, and maybe some of the leaders are in this room uh, tonight. I expect they are. So here is an article by the ex-mayor of Bogota in Colombia, I hope I'm saying that correctly, Bogota, and he had a design objective. And his design objective was, can we design cities for happiness? Now, this particular mayor, he's not a designer. He probably doesn't come from a design background. He certainly doesn't come from a user experience background. But he had this wonderful objective about designing cities for happiness. So what did he do? It's all very well having a dream, but you've got to convert that into something that's tangible and something that's operational. So what did he do? Well, this is just some of the things that he did. He built 52 new schools. He established and improved 1,200 parks in the cities. He built three central and ten neighbourhood libraries. He built 100 nurseries for children under five, and so on and so forth. So this is to say that it's, it's good to have these ideals, but you also need very strong leadership, and you actually need someone that can operationalise it in order to meet the vision. So everybody's trying to copy Apple. Do they actually know operationally, culturally, skills-wise, management-wise, leadership-wise, and so on and so forth, and whatever else you want to add, on what Apple is doing internally in order to meet their vision? And I would say, no. I'd say a lot of business people, a lot of business people out there are saying, 
be like Apple, but they don't really know what it takes to be like Apple. That's if you want to be like Apple in the first place. So I want to finish with, with this, and I thank you for your patience. Three turtles on a rock. And the first turtle is engineering. And I'm guessing the engineering turtles are at the back, because it's, you know, the engineers are usually the ones that, that like to drink. Engineers. Marketing is our second turtle. And our third turtle is design. And I'm probably missing a discipline, but there's only three turtles. <laughs> and so, the question is, and I leave this with you tonight, is that in order to deliver on value, in order to create successful products, if we're moving beyond commoditization, if we truly want to 